Hi everybody. It's one of those very rare Sundays in my life where I'm not at church, where I'm not uh, called on to lead worship or preach a sermon or do something like that. And so I'm home and um, in my most comfortable chair and uh, been taking a, a lazy morning. And I'm doing something at the moment that Steph keeps telling me I need to do. And that is she keeps telling me over and over, has for years, you need to put something on Facebook or post something online about some biblical discussion or theology question or Bible question or something like that that we've been having. So uh, within the last couple of days, uh, several different people have mentioned to me a story going around, I guess, on Facebook. I'm not on Facebook, as most of you know. And it has to do with the Ten Commandments and um, a well-known uh, pastor in the evangelical world, um, at least many people are saying that he has said the Ten Commandments uh, have really nothing to say to New Covenant believers and so forth. Now, I don't know. I haven't read his comments, and this isn't in response to him anyway. Um, this is just in general, uh, kind of springboarding from that into a uh, really quick discussion about how the Old Testament law relates to a New Covenant believer. It's a huge, multifaceted discussion. I'm not even going to try to do a deep dive. I am telling you right up front, this is really scratching the surface. But in case it's something you've wondered about, and I find that many people have, maybe this will help you in a broad sense. In the Old Testament, you had essentially three kinds of law, for lack of a better way to say it. You had civil law, which had everything to do with the actual government that was set up in Israel by God. You had a ceremonial law that had to do with the various laws that had, that, that uh, um, directed and guided uh, the worship in the temple and with animal sacrifices and, and many things like that. And then you had moral law. Uh, and moral law was law that had existed before the civil government of uh, Israel was instituted by God through Moses, and uh, it continues on to this day. So uh, one of the ways to think about it, and again, I want to emphasize, this is not a, a deep dive. This isn't covering all the potential and possibilities and everything else involved with the subject. But, but one of the ways to think about it is this. So you have civil law. Uh, civil law would say for this particular crime, here's the punishment. Well, clearly, we don't live under the theocracy that was set up uh, in Israel by God. Uh, and nobody has ever lived in that kind of theocracy since that time. So much of the civil law does not apply to us. Now, there were moral uh, objectives and moral realities behind much of that civil law that can still be very instructional to us. But the simple fact of the matter is that we don't have a right in 21st century America, for instance, to um, uh, execute someone for some of the things that God said you could execute someone for under the Old Covenant. That was a civil law. There were laws regarding property and restitution and things like that. They simply don't apply to us because we're operating under a different civil system. Then you had your ceremonial law. And ceremonial law could include all kinds of things. Let's take one of the most common ones. Um, uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, for instance, we are told that it's an abomination to eat shellfish. Uh, we are told that we need tassels on our underwear. We are told that we need uh, railings on our roofs, things like that. Okay, those were a mixture of ceremonial and civil laws. Um, those were put in place for a variety of reasons. One of the biggest reasons was uh, so that the law would help to emphasize the uh, nature of genuine holiness, that it is something that is set apart from the norm, from the usual. It literally is a cut above. It also, uh, the Old Testament law, both civil and especially ceremonial, was designed to show you how um, uh, aggressive sin is. Um, under the Old Covenant, sin uh, and, and unclean things that were ceremonially unclean, those were things that would stain and damage. They would, they would actually uh, remove your state or your condition of holiness. So those laws were, were put up for things like that. And then, of course, you had moral laws. 
things, for instance, don't murder. Um, don't sleep with somebody else's spouse. Don't lie. Um, you had moral laws that had to do with God directly, like love him and him alone. Um, don't serve any other gods, those kinds of things. Don't steal would be a, a great example of that. There was a civil law application of that clear moral law that predated the civil law. So you come into the new covenant, and some of these things are very obvious. So the new covenant was written um, under the auspices of the Roman Empire. So the civil law simply didn't apply anymore. It was in a different civil society, as I've already said, it is for us today. Uh, the ceremonial law. The Bible is so crystal clear about most of this ending. Um, so you have, for instance, uh, the prohibition on shellfish or pork or, or something like that. Uh, you go to Acts 10, and God goes out of his way three times to make sure that one of the early apostles, Peter, is told these things are now okay to eat. Why were they okay now and not then? Well, because it never was some sort of bottom line moral abomination to eat shrimp or a pork chop. Um, it was part of God in the Old Covenant trying to show the nature of holiness, how it sets you apart, how it makes demands on you. That has been removed in the New Covenant. And uh, so we are blessed to live under the New Covenant. By the way, I strongly encourage you to enjoy it immensely. Eat a pork chop tonight, something like that. Um, and um, uh, even things as far as dress codes and so forth. The New Testament is very clear about those things ending. The Apostle Paul especially, who himself was, uh, prior to his conversion, a very observant Jew, a rabbi, and clearly a super conservative one, uh, God gave him a tremendous grace to talk to people in his day, and of course, through the Word of God, people in our day, 2,000 years later, about how those things are so truly unimportant when it comes to genuine holiness. But the moral law was very different. Jesus shows up. And he tells us in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, he talks about various aspects of it. He tells us, I did not come to get rid of the law. I came to fulfill it. The law, the Old Testament law, the Old Testament covenant was good for a while, but it's nothing compared to the beauty of the new covenant we have through Jesus Christ. But it did serve a purpose, and it was based on eternal, immovable, moral law that itself is based on the character of God. So. What you have in Jesus is not him saying, hey, don't worry about those old laws. They're meaningless. Just do what you want. He actually, in every single case that he deals with moral law, he actually elevates it. So if you go back and read the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, uh, take murder as an example. The law says, as long as you leave them breathing, you're okay. Uh, Jesus says, uh, listen, you got to leave them, do better than leave them breathing. It isn't that you just can't take their life. I won't even let you say unkind things about them. You can't even say you hate them. Uh, he elevated that law. Uh, under the old covenant, um, there were laws about, uh, about uh, marriage and divorce, for instance. Um, Jesus comes along and he says, no, I'm telling you, first of all, you stay faithful to that one and you stay married to that one. Oh, and by the way, the issue of adultery, uh, the old covenant said, just don't have sex with somebody you're not married to. Jesus says, I'm telling you, I'm going to elevate that. I don't even want you lusting after someone else. So in every case, Jesus elevates the whole picture of that. When Jesus is asked, what's the greatest commandment? You of course, probably already know the answer. He says the, the, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like to the first, and that is love your neighbor as yourself. And what you'll notice is this that if you do those things, if you do love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, you will automatically fulfill all 10 commandments without even making them a focus. Because to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you will obey the first three commandments. If you love your neighbor and yourself, you will obey four through 10. You can look at them yourself and see what I'm talking about. So uh, please understand, for those who, who like to, and, and unfortunately there are a lot of people like this, who like to say, well, uh, you know, what do you believe out of the Bible? The old says this and the new says this and whatever. They're not in conflict with one another. The old was showing us how um, uh, sin was so aggressive and how easily uh, sin could, uh, 
could destroy our holiness and our place and our position uh, with God. Then the new covenant comes along and Jesus gives his life and then the, the Holy Spirit is poured out on us. And now those old laws, according to the prophet, are written in our hearts and they're written in our hearts through the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. And so now what happens is this. Um, our righteousness, because it is the righteousness of Jesus himself. It's not the righteousness of my performance of keeping a law. It's the righteousness of Christ himself. My righteousness is so profound that now when I come up against sin, instead of sin contaminating me, I get to overcome and destroy the sin through the presence of the risen Lord that is in me and ministering through me through the person of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I hope that gives some clarity, just in case it's something you've wondered and wanted to talk about. And uh, hope you have a terrific rest of your Sunday, everybody. Love you.